Okay, so I'm good to let people in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Am I really close to the thing? Thanks, everyone, and thanks for bearing with us. I'm sorry about that thing that just happened. Uh, anyway, good evening, everyone. My name is Louisa Uliat, and I'm sure there talks about the photographer's gallery. Hopefully, you can hear me in the back, Grace. Uh, I'm honored to be introducing um, artist Helen Hammock, whose new commission, Concrete Feather and Reports of Tax, is featured at the gallery. Currently on view here, Helen's film responds to the hardness of the industrial landscape, the experiences of, the, the experiences of those there now, and their connections to its past. Through conversations, we are brought into life in Mount Rochdale, using pieces and artifacts from the collection at Touchstones. The people featured in the film reflect and engage with the objects as they link their stories of ownership, collectivity, migration, labor, familial legacy, and personal circumstance to the collection. The film is about how these stories endure and the ideas that these objects are living and imbued with human experience and existence. Joining Helen tonight is curator Louis Delton Gilbert. Louis is creative director of the Vibe Caltech, a new organization exploring the intersections of Black creativity, culture, and innovation. He has previously produced exhibitions and presentations at White Cube, Breathe and Create. He also works closely with artists like Janet Nicker on various creative projects. In terms of format for this evening, we'll be just begin with a discussion between Helen and Lewis as they talk through the process of creating this moving image work and her experiences of putting together that project. There'll be time at the end for questions and contributions from you. If you're with us at the gallery, you can simply raise your hand. And if you're joining us on Zoom, you can submit your questions using the chat function available there. After the end of the discussion, for those of you who are here at the gallery, you'll have the opportunity to visit the exhibition until eight o'clock. For those on Zoom, there are some video functions available on our website. Um, anyway, before moving on to Helen and to Lewis, I just want to say thank you to my colleagues, Grace Armitage, Janice McLaren, and Karen McQuaid, and our co-commissioners at FBU at Touchstones Rochdales. And thank you also to you for joining us here tonight and to you online. Uh, and now, uh, please join me in welcoming Helen and Lewis. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, firstly, I just wanted to say the opportunity to kind of go back to when I was first introduced to your work. Um, I remember it was during, in 2016, uh, me and Jane, this is where I And I was doing a project with an artist called Beverly Bennett, and she told me that I just had to come and see this, this work. And I was like, I don't have a ticket, I don't have a ticket. Um, and you were doing this premiere or the, um, there's a hole in the sky part one, of this and she called it. <clears throat> and I remember to see my, and it was like the most moving experience I think I've had in my adult life. <laughs> I remember messaging you on Facebook so I didn't even left the to tell you how incredible it was. So I just wanted to kind of take this opportunity to thank you for you know all that you do because it's so important to so many people. <laughs> Someone said that that gush should get out of the way. <laughs> um, you know, it's been so incredible to see you kind of move on since then, you know, from you know, blackness, from you know, wealth power, poverty, vulnerability, social histories, and then comes to, you know, film, photography, print, text, song, performance, um, all of which are in the exhibition downstairs. Um, but I just wondered if you could give us a brief description of the exhibition for those who might not see it yet. Okay, so um, it's, I guess the foundation of it is a film, it's a two screen film work, and it's made up of, in some ways, almost sketches, moments, um, experiences of different people um, in Rochdale, whether they're group performances, so um, going from uh, a group of older people who choreograph, they belong to a movement group and they choreograph a piece about their experience of living in Rochdale, uh, to um, two women making rice puddings, one who uh, has a background from Ukraine and one who has a background from Pakistan and the completely different ways they make rice puddings, um, we talked to the first uh, Muslim um, mayor of Rochdale um, and he reads part of his speech. So it's, I guess it's a kind of collage of experience um, and all of the conversations were kind of made over two and a half years. 
Um, I don't know whether it feels that way, but we'll probably talk about the process a little bit more later. Um, but that's the film. Um, it's quite a long film. Um, one hour. Long, I hope not, no. but maybe, <laughs> well, maybe it does. Um, but it felt like to make it any shorter, I had planned to make a short film. Mm. And um, maybe people think of me as making long films, but actually they go from nine minutes all the way to one hour 40. So I make many short films as well as long films. But this one, it felt like to do justice to the relationships and the conversations and try to make the connections and the intersections it needed to have some kind of body. And that, that meant length as well as mm. kind of depth, I suppose. Um, and then in the other room, we have um, objects that we used as part of the workshop conversations to kind of stimulate further conversation. So I did a kind of first select of lots of images from the archive and from the collection of that Touchstones, which is enormous for the size of, for the size of the museum that Touchstones is. It's an absolutely enormous collection. Um, and so we, we had one, before lockdown happened, we had one group who came in to um, the store to go through certain paintings and objects. And we literally just walked all the way through the store. And as we walked through, people were saying, oh, um, that reminds me of my granny's sewing machine. Or actually, that reminds me, somebody else said, that reminds me in Iran of the sewing machine that my mother's sister had, it looked exactly the same as that. So we had those kinds of conversations as we walked around. And that was the basis really for me then thinking, okay, I'm going to try and select objects that reflect the Industrial Revolution, the kinds of, um, I suppose the kinds of jobs that I mm. knew people in Rochdale have been doing historically, and then some um, more contemporary objects. And of course, paintings that were about community relationships, families, um, so you will find objects upstairs um, next to the film, and they are different objects in London here at the Public Office Gallery as they um, to the ones that are in Washington. And um, so was it when you were going through those objects that the title Concrete Pleasant and Boston Tax came to you? But well, no, it came to you quite early on in the mm. process. Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't know, in commissions quite often people say, Can we have a working title, please? Can we have a working title? Um, and actually, it just came to me really very quickly. And I think I started doing some of the research around um, the Rochdale principles, Rochdale being the, in the Western world, the birthplace of the cooperative movement. And I started to have this feeling, which was about the kind of weight and heaviness of the industrial landscape and the pressures and why the, the Rochdale principles came into place. Um, and so it was this relationship, I suppose, or the juxtaposition maybe, or the tension between um, brutality and fragility and how communities try in some way with the Rochdale principles in this situation to mediate and manage that kind of relationship between brutality and fragility. And um, so, you know, it references some of the processes, concrete tax, um, and then tries to look at the kinds of nuance and the care that communities actually can offer within themselves. And speaking of duality, juxtaposition, what, what made you make the film mutual channel? I think it's very, I mean, it's a huge part of the film, but how did you come to that? Because I, I think there was something about the play between scenes and the play between landscape and object and humanity and humanness. And um, a single screen just didn't feel like it would hold it. The conversations that needed to happen across all of the different locations, between people, placing objects in relationship to maybe a scene that's with somebody who's walking around, like Pete walking around Heliedale, talking about his commitment to biodiversity and bees, um, juxtaposed with something else. And so it was, it, it felt necessary to kind of, in order to stitch something, weave something together, um, that the two screens needed to speak to each other and offer up different things going on. So if you can layer things, then you can have numerous conversations going on at one time. Speaking of Pete and his bees, <laughs> <laughs> how do you find the participants that you work with and how easy is it to encourage them to say up? Well? Because they all appear quite comfortable on the screen. Mm -hmm. They're speaking about very sensitive personal issues, but they all seem to have ears to come. Yeah. How do you get, how do you get them on board? Well, I was thinking about this because as I was squished on the tube on the way here, and um, 
actually we the whole project went over two and a half years so we had we had to think of a way we, were, we began the project and then lockdown began and the first lockdown began and we had to find a way to try to support people to access workshops conversations um, if they wanted to initially though um i would say this for me was uh I guess I've never worked with a producer before. So that's the first thing, is that quite often there are, I might make um, connections or I might contact different organizations or groups um, and ask them if they have people who are interested. But actually we had Rochdale as Touchstones as the partner um, and they already have really good solid links in many different communities in Rochdale and then Film Video Umbrella um, enabled me to have a producer it's the first time I've ever worked with a producer and so some of those um, connections were not my I didn't have to make those initial connections my job was then once people had said hey, maybe I'm interested in that I'll come and see because that's what people were saying but then my job was to say this is what I'm thinking of are you interested can we start having some conversations and just doing it very very slowly and in very considered ways so you know there was a there was a moment in lockdown where we were probably doing eight online workshops a week. And, wow. um, and, and it kind of required that in order for people to feel comfortable because when you can't sit next to somebody, when you can't sit in a room with them, it's much more complicated to feel safe and able to express yourself and share in a way. And actually in the film, there are all, all, almost there are stories that I've kind of had to or felt that I've had to pull back some of what was shared in order, I think, to have more conversations. But actually people really shared openly and honestly, and you know, some of the workshops were incredibly emotional. And, um, and I think, yeah, it, it took time. It took some real strategic management, which what I didn't do, thank goodness, <laughs> because I would have messed it up, that kind of strategic management of it. But I think it, it's about commitment. And I knew that with this project, I needed to make a commitment to people. And so, you know, we sometimes had workshops where we mixed two groups together. Sometimes we had two individuals that I thought would have an interesting conversation, having had group workshops. So we brought them together. So it also required a great commitment from the people who wanted to be in the film. Um, well, I mean, I, yeah, I think it really shows. So it, everyone seems that it's going to be putting that into their relationship. Um, how much finish do you have? If it because this is the oh, I just don't know, know. how much yeah, you know you my first I think my first edit was three hours, fifteen minutes. <laughs> and uh, then I was like, okay, oh, this is a little bit more. Um but I mean I yeah, I've probably I, I don't know, so I don't really toss it up, but I mean I don't know, there's probably a hundred hours worth of different kinds of footage. Um, and then it's just about going through that and trying to figure out. I mean, we had, um, so we had uh, uh, all of the interviews, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I forgot what the word was. What's the word? Oh, when it gets transcribed. transcribed. Thank you, transcribed. Um, and I had like a pile of paper this thick to go through um, in order to, to do a first edit. Okay, this is too much. Second edit, start to drop it into the film. Oh my goodness, another edit. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really, really long process. Um, and does it take you back working with lots of people back to your days and photos in social work in those days? I mean, I think in terms of social work, I think it's an interesting one because I quite often get asked the question, oh, is this why you're able to work with people? And I I do think that um there's something about experience that means that you are you feel able to and confident enough to ask some of the questions. And but also understand some of the ethics behind what you're doing, and then it enables you to, I suppose, have a bit of a blueprint in some ways. Um, but I, I suppose I always feel like I came to social work with that, and then the kind of uh, strategy of how to use who I am enabled me to do it because I think not all social workers work in that way, and um, just you know, just as not all artists work in the way that I would choose to work, so it's. Um, it's, it's very much about, I think, who, who I am. So, yeah, and I think, you know, doing sociology 
many, many years before I kind of went to art school was about understanding for me social structures and, um, and power dynamics and having some language as well in my own mind about what I saw and felt about the world. And then, yeah, social work offered me this incredible opportunity to actually come alongside people that I didn't know and people that I wouldn't necessarily have met. And so it's about learning from those relationships. So those are the things that I've got, the gifts, I suppose, if you like. Um, is to be privileged enough to, to be alongside people mm. Mm, mm, and they wouldn't normally be alongside me. Yeah, I mean, it shows that you're very good at it. Going back to kind of language, um, as you were just saying, I would just quote you, but in the film you say, the unknown is nevertheless, there is always something familiar. Um, and I kind of wanted to speak about if anything was similar to you when you watched mm. that. Well, I... I suppose the things, probably the two things that I feel, <laughs> the two things that probably feel um, the most familiar were working with the young people. And some of the familiarity is about, what, while I was doing social work, I, I specialised, I suppose, in working a lot with young people. So running kind of therapeutic groups with young people. And then when I left, um, when I left working in statutory social work, I ran a multi-agency support centre. That was while I was doing my photography BA. So it was kind of like this moment where I was kind of moving and changing. Um, and so some of the conversations that we were having with the young people in the workshops were the same conversations that I had, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. And so there's some of the familiarity that's about that, that's about hearing these cycles of stories that, that keep coming back. Um, and then the other stories were the kind of um, stories about being first and second generation in this country. And they reminded me of stories that feel really familiar to me in terms of my dad or my dad's family. Um, and, you know, whether my dad, born in Cuba, was from Jamaica, whether it was about, you know, the Caribbean or whether it was about Pakistan or whether it was about the Ukraine, the kinds of stories that are about structure oppression and marginalization were the same mm -hmm. and about the hopes that parents have for their children in that transition living in a, in a new country or a new city in a new space a new religion all of those things um, felt felt really familiar to me mm -hmm. but there's also something about it's not necessarily to do with this film but i re remember um when the film changing room was first shown, um, I think that was in 2015 in London. And it's very much about race, but it's also about this conversation with my dad. And um, somebody came up to me and she, I guess maybe she was mid sixties, a white woman who um, looked almost a bit out of place in the gallery. And she came up to me and she said, oh, I just wanted to say to you that, um, I'm not black, I don't know what it is to be black, but I want you to know that I was really touched by that film. I, it dipped into everything that I wanted to say to my dad before he died. And so this idea that the familiar can come when you're not expecting it, and the familiar is everywhere, and you just have to be open to it, and, and, and it will come, I guess, if you're lucky, you know, because there's some things about connection. So. Yeah, I mean, because I think when I was unfortunate, I should say that, there's a really complicated about that as a notion, you know, mm. that there's always going to be people looking at it. But um, I guess it may be quite frightening. As well. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, way. because they're not all pleasant feelings mm. that are triggered or, yeah. Mm. Um, did you learn anything from the kind of watch that? Mm. I suppose, I don't know that I learned anything. I mean, not that I didn't learn anything, but I suppose there's something about a sense that people do. Um, I had started to feel really like, oh my God, what is happening in this country? Like I had got myself into a space where I could not see a way forward. And, you know, I even was like going, oh, could I live here? Could I live there? You know, so I got into this space of like um, escape. I need to get out of this country because the politics are becoming more and more oppressive. And actually I went to Rochdale um, to a place that is not a privileged um, town at all. 
part of kind of greater Manchester, but absolutely its own town. And people were open and warm and politicised and thinking and conversational. They're interested in dialogue. They're interested in um, talking about politics as well. Mm -hmm. In a kind of whether that's in a knitting group or a, there was something that suddenly felt quite alive. And so I suppose my learning experience is that you can get yourself into a space and you have to remember that something will perhaps get you out of it if you can be open to it. Same, I guess I'm saying the same thing, but I was surprised by it. Yeah. Um, I didn't know how people would receive me or the idea of the project. Or um, And we talked a lot as well about the North-South divide and um, how real and live that is. And, and that was really important. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think it, it, it's probably shown its heart made a bit, but I was shot to have by birth. The participants were on screen, but also the kind of artifacts that you were, mm. you, I don't know, the shape on the that you were able to choose from. Yeah. So um, I wanted to ask you actually something, this, and again, just this is a quote, which is going to get directly following on from that. Um, the sign that you're making in your film says, that, um, we say that we are becoming a more tolerant society, but I don't think we are. We're becoming a society that doesn't care. And I just wanted to mm -hmm. kind of talk about that statement and what you took from that and why you included it. Okay, this what? is a difficult one, yeah. Um, I mean, I think Tracy was talking about, she was really talking about, she runs a, a project, which is an incredible project. So part of the um, furniture making and um, is, is kind of a, a space for people to come and focus on making something, but actually it's, it's a place where they get support. And she was, I guess she was talking about this notion that places feel left behind and they feel uncared for. And um, this idea that we imagine as a nation, as a population, generationally people consider that everything is about progress. And I think she was talking about this idea that um, we need to stop and actually ask what's going on and who has been left behind and who continues to be left behind and who is newly left behind because things have shifted and changed. Um, so I suppose my, my answer is, I think there are particular historical um, contexts where change has happened and then, you know, the civil rights movement, um, the women's movement, the women's liberation movement, the Black Lives Matter at the moment as well. Like, there are all these movements that push certain things forward and then we believe everything has changed and everything is okay. But I think it's about really pulling us back. You know, we are certainly in a, living in a moment where the politics are really very, very problematic and dangerous in this country. And so we have this kind of, on the one hand, this idea that we have this open and progressive society and which has mostly been you know um, changed and developed and moved by people who are marginal because they they have had the, the reason to um, and then there are people who are I feel completely lost and slightly duped and manipulated by kind of different kinds of political structures in which we inhabit um, and so I, I I wouldn't say that we're a society that doesn't care, but I think we're a society that has been encouraged from the you know, 1980s to only consider what matters to ourselves, and that's a problem. Mm. It's a problem when you live in a, a space with other people. Absolutely. But I mean, I think what's so incredible about your work is that you, know, you, got, you give people voices and kind of shine the light on different parts of history, if that's, you know, kind of revisiting conversations with James Gordon or you know, bringing artifacts out from the collection that you've got upstairs. Um, and I wondered if there is a kind of moment in history that you could revisit as a failure. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit dangerous, I think. That's a bit da no, it's a bit, I think it's a bit dangerous as a black person. Yeah. To, I can't imagine where I would want to go back to mm. and be safe, you know? The reality of it really is. If I imagine myself as someone else, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, to, I think, you know, to, 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 to be black, to be queer, you know, I, I would not necessarily have the most wonderful life if I went back historically. So 
perhaps I'll stay here. <laughs> I like that as a quote. Perhaps I'll stay. <laughs> um, so your quote, some of the key quotes that I kind of love from the film is when it's pink the world enough. Yes. Talking about these and so they all have a purpose and everything is linked together. And I kind of feel that that really embodies the whole film mm -hmm. as a whole and everyone in that. Um, and I wondered if you could just talk to us a bit more about the specifics in that. Mm. Well, it's interesting because you said that to me earlier. You picked out that quote earlier and said, oh, the Big Man. Um, and for me, that that quote or, or that section where he talks about bees, and actually it's a really long section. He talks in great detail about the different roles of bees and how bees interact with each other, how they interact with their kind of ecological environment, how they steal nests, how they, they're a cuckoo bit, you know, all of the kinds of different um, behaviours that bees have really mirror our society, I guess. And um, so he was talking about the complexity of that. Um, and, and we talked for ages afterwards about how, how complex it is and how we often walk in the world without recognising the complexity of who we are in relation to other people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he was a, he was a retired joiner. Um, so he'd worked his whole life working. He didn't want, his father was a builder and he didn't want to work with his dad. So he decided he'd go in to college and try and do something else. And he, he, he said that he worked for many, many years. He said it was okay, but actually he found with biodiversity, somebody put a fly up in his door saying there's this area of land where people were just dumping burnt out cars and all their rubbish that they, they didn't want to take to the tip. They were just dumping it on this piece of land on the estate where he lives. And somebody had put this um, fly through the door saying, do you want to do something about it? And for him, that was the beginning of this moment that he has grabbed. And he now you know, works with a, a huge team of volunteers. And they've, I think they've won three awards this year for the kind of biodiversity that they have, the number of insects and plant life that they've encouraged and have on this really quite small plot of land. Um, He's, he's quite amazing. So I just feel like people, that I've met people who were amazing in whatever way. Um, Rahela was an artist who um, also teaches and she talked a lot about her family and how they would sew in one room. They'd have different sewing machines all going on. So as soon as she came home from school, the sewing machines were going. Her dad was sewing, her mum was sewing, her brothers were sewing, all in her house. And I, I guess there's something about the... The windows that have been opened up by these people and the generosity of that but it's just also really interesting and I suppose I you know I make lots of work um, with archives and I suppose what on some level I'm interested in building new archives that tell different stories um, so I want people to know about Rahela's family sewing in the bedroom you know, and how they, many of the um, clothing lines that were made then went into uh, mainstream shops. You know, I'm interested in some of that history being told and being heard. You know, I'm interested in the Ukrainian choir singing a song that's about loss and love. Um, and then Irena, who then talks about her family and coming to Rochdale and what that meant. And then Sultan reading his speech and talking about having... Um, a disability that's really has been really painful and uh, kind of but he talks with such energy and he tells his whole story I suppose I mean that's that's the kind of interview that I have maybe three hours on yeah. and had to you know pull it like that but um, there's something about how everybody is interested and I, I absolutely believe that. Um, yeah I mean I think it's the film it really is it covers diversity in so many ways and it really does give you a snapshot of the part of mm. England um, and kind of undoes a lot of the kind of erasure of different people and voices that we've had. So from have you had any conversations with participants about what it's been like to be represented on the screen? Yeah, yeah, many conversations. <laughs> and you know, I was I was really kind of surprised, shocked. Um, but, you know, I think 18 people maybe came down for the opening yeah. day, we had to get up really, really early and came on a minibus, some people came on the train, um, in order to be here for the opening, and they sat and they watched it, and 
some of the young people videoed it while they were sitting watching themselves, going, oh my God, this is so embarrassing, but I still did video myself. And then um, I think three of the women from the Ukrainian choir, you know, watched it through about three times, um, you know, waiting for the, to hear and see, and also interested in other people's stories, because that's the other thing is that people haven't seen who else was in it. They, they met each other, but they haven't right. seen the footage. So it was the first time to see how their stories interacted with each other. Um, so yes, and then I went up to the opening in Rochdale um, and we, we did a different thing. We had like a day opening. So we met together and we had a really long, long day. Um, and yeah, and I've, you know, I've stayed in conversation with a few people from the project who, who've told me how things are going. And, you know, Pete's been back a few times to the exhibition in Rochdale and he let me know that they won the awards and um, I've been in contact with Rahela. So it's, you yeah, know, we've, the conversations are, are real, they're best to know. Um, um, what's it like for you putting up out there on the screen? Uh, <laughs> I suppose there's part of me that thinks if I'm going to ask other people to, on some level, mm. it's important that I feel able to do it. And also, I think with some of the films that I've made before, I think it's been important for me to place myself in relationship to other people. Um, I think I've said a few times that when I made the long note um, in Northern Ireland, I was I was worried about making that work, <clears throat> that it wasn't my experience, it wasn't my story. And um, so there was something important about me being in there, whether it's a hand or a face, or to try to somehow speak of who I am in relationship um, with other people. So. Um, and before we go into um, I just wanted to ask you if you could have a little bit about what's next for you. What you've got, what back from yeah, so um, yes, I'm making, hopefully making a new film and a book um, for a show that's actually going first to LA um, and then back to New Orleans, um, which is, uh, I mean, I, this is amazing because actually it's probably the first time where I can just, it, it's a commission and it's a residency and I can make what I want. And so at the moment, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, it's a real dream. I've had, um, um, I'm working with Rivers Institute and also the Armstead Archives, which are the oldest um, African-American archives in the States, which happen to be in New Orleans. Um, and so at the moment, it's, I've had a research trip, so I've just come back from that, so it's about taking stock. Um, and I've met some very interesting people. Um, and then next week I'm flying to Germany, I have a solo show there which is, um, I'm going to show three films, and then uh, my whole, it's almost the entire print, um, what's the word, archive of my own. Yeah, so that, that's quite a complicated, complex show, and um, there's a project there who are making my band for me this time, um, and also we're doing a, a kind of a, a performance together, I've spoken in some word of performance, which I'll be going back every, every month over a three-month period to work with a group of, of people in the community there in order that we can do a performance on the on the closing of the show. Wow. So there's Not that. Just that the successful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bit busy, but yeah. Um, I think we've got some questions online as well that we want to kind of ask this. I'll see you if that's it. I'm sorry, I feel like I haven't really looked out. It's I really, so it's really <laughs> weird because it's like the camera is there, and so because it's being streamed, and then so then I keep trying to do that, and then I think, oh no, that's weird, but then I'm talking yeah. to you, so oh, I'm, I'm going to turn this way now because it felt a bit weird. Sorry. Um, you have one question from someone online that just asked how all the kind of things you had to edit out. Is there one thing that you really wish you could have put in but couldn't? Yes, it's absolutely the conversation about bees. Yeah, yeah, definitely, because it, it almost, you know, I could make a, uh, maybe a 10 minute film that says lots of the things, the themes that came out in the film across the whole film, just using the conversation about things. So I, I think that's probably, yeah, my biggest wish that I could have had. Yeah. Um, if you have any questions for me, 
there and see the the charm and all of the other cards. Um, no pressure. <laughs> um, I have one more question for you. I've got several, but okay. I remember in your show in 2020, Kate McGarry, mm -hmm. and it's a screen pen, and it said, Can you remember when you last did nothing? So I want to ask you, Helen, <laughs> can you remember when you last did nothing? Oh my goodness, I don't know if I can actually. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I can. Well, I was, I was talking to Louisa earlier about. Yeah. The kind of pressure and the kind of roller coaster of um, continual making mm -hmm. and continual working, and whether that's kind of internationally, but it's more about you know where do you find the space to make, and and that moment of rising was the moment for me to to know what that felt like, and then it feels like it's fallen away again a little bit, like it's 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 gone a bit, and it, yeah, it feels a little bit manic at the moment, and so. Um, I'm, I have faith that that moment will come back again, and I, you know, I've tried to kind of cut down things at the back end of this year because I think I was looking at how many films and books I need to make before the end of April, and but it's almost sleepless. Like sleepless I remember when, so after my first night, I, don't know, I had like a podcast for a bit in 2016. And we interviewed um, on this podcast, and you said exactly the same thing about slowing down, and that was seven years ago. Oh, no. <laughs> so, oh, no, so maybe it was me. Oh, God. If that's the case, I can't Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, I don't know about people in this room, but I think it feels that when you're a maker, because um, it's so hard to make a living being a maker, you have to or you almost feel like you have to keep going so you have to keep making you have to have other jobs you have to you know like i still teach you know you have to keep doing the things that you're doing in order to um but maybe also there's something a bit driven about people who make as well perhaps yeah perhaps that's true yeah like this is a big name i think um, we're all very grateful that you do because we like seeing what you do any questions in here? Um, we did have a question online. Uh, we encourage people who are actually with us too. That's the sense. Uh, so, the question that we've done um, the field chat is What does your live performance give you as an artist, and how is it different from your film and other work? Okay. Um, well, I think because um, I mean, I, I sometimes talk about this idea of different registers of the voice. So this idea that when we sing or we speak in a kind of performative way, it's not the same as the voice that I might use on the voiceover. There's something immediate about performance. Um, you're in a space, you feel the heat of other people's bodies, you see them, you look at them, you're exposed to them um, in terms of proximity. And there's a difference. There's a different opportunity, I suppose, for connection. The connection is slightly different um, for me and I think for audiences as well. I think the, the, there's something about the power of the body that does something in life performance um, that I think for me works as it works for me. I feel something different and I think, I, I, or I work on the premise, that an audience who has come have come because they also feel something different when something is live. Um, following up on that then, during lockdown and you know, delays and everything, has there been anything that you've learned in that process of uh, COVID and distance that actually was pretty successful that you can incorporate? So, thinking differently about that immediacy, that heat that comes from people being in the same room, are there strategies that you learned through like online workshops or reading people's body language differently? Uh, you might into your well, I suppose I would always rather be in a room with people and I'll, I, will, I can't, you know, even though many of the workshops had to be online and I, you know, we found strategies to do that and we made workshop groups very small, so we had to do more of them to somehow kind of, um, on some level to try to form space for that intimacy and but it's not what I would choose. So I, I know that it can be done, 
but I was so relieved when suddenly we could do the workshops live again, we could meet people in person and we could, we could choose together the locations that we shot in because that was part of the process as well, is that I wouldn't know where to go um, in Rochdale. There were things that I saw that I, I said, oh, actually, I'd like to shoot there. But most of the places that we shot in were selected by the people whose stories they were incorporated into, I suppose. And all of those things really do felt to me like I needed to be there. And there's something about sighting yourself physically in space as well, where you understand yourself in a new geographical space, location, landscape. Um, so I, I'm sure I learned some skills. I know how to send Zoom links. <laughs> I know that, you know, the workshops can't ever be as long, that you have to have lots of breaks. You know, I know what, I've learned all of those things. But, and I guess what I've learned as well is it, it, it doesn't really do anything compared to actually being what we do. Um, it's not your energy and time by the way. Uh, people are really, and uh, that kind of intimacy that you get from time and familiarity. Uh, my question, I guess, is like, where do you need to find that interest and engagement in your own work? And you know, you were saying earlier about that creativity that can get really bogged down in the process as in meetings. Mm. Um, yeah, I think if I, I think if I wasn't able to place myself in new contexts, if I wasn't able to work with people in whatever way that is, um, I would really struggle, I think, with the, with the weight of everything. Um, and I get so much energy from being around other people and having dialogues and listening as well as speaking. And those things are, yeah, they're really sort of core part of who I am as a human being. Um, I can also be a complete hermit. Uh, but I think that's because I have to, you know, I find myself just running away to kind of do that in my house, in my little house. And it's, um, so there's, yeah, it's that kind of um, extreme, maybe, is that I really do like to be with people and alongside and in conversation with people, and then I want to run away. Um, and those things really work for me in terms of making. And the hermit element, to be your word, it can be really creative. Yeah, and rest is a very active state in many ways, also mm -hmm. to create that possibility. Yeah, so, Helen, it might be a bit too sort of long for this, but um, I'm just interested to know a little bit more about your notes. Can you tell us anything? <laughs> <It's not laughs> <exciting. laughs> I mean, it might be a bit soon, and I know you've got to go back because yes. time is tight, but just yes. what are your takings from it? Just a few. Just, um, um, what are you looking forward to going back to? Filming, so lots of filming because I, I spent, um, we were there for like mm, almost four weeks and I spent a lot of time in an archive, which was incredible. Um, and I want to go back, I want to listen to more music, I want to go back to um, reconnect with my trumpet teacher. So I'm going to have, I had some trumpet lessons while I was there and I'm going to carry on having them on Zoom. And then, uh, and then when I go back, I'm going to reconnect and we're going to go and buy a new trumpet so that I can have uh, what's better than a kind of child's trumpet, which is what I've got because I've played trumpet for a child. So there are lots of things that have come out which are about my experience of being there. And, you know, it's, it's not a Cassie Profaro where I'm going to sing a pre opera event. I'm not going to start playing jazz trumpet. But it's about kind of being in that space and um, connecting with what happens in that city and um, I met uh, I met both a queen and a chief from some of the black masking tradition of Mardi Gras and we had conversations about where that's come from, what that's about, the relationship between the Native American communities historically and the black communities um, and so I'm going back to have another conversation and um, do some filming. Um, I went to some second lines uh, jazz second line, so um, they're all rehearsing at the moment for Mardi Gras, so um, that was interesting. I'm much more interested in many ways in the rehearsals than I am in the actual um, procession itself, because I'm really interested in labour and the preparation that people put into that. Um, I ate food, um, <laughs> uh, which, which was which was interesting, actually, as someone who doesn't usually eat a lot of meat and I can't eat seafood. So um, it was it was interesting to navigate that and find my way. So that was that was fun, actually. 
um, yeah, the Jazz Museum, um, yeah, lots of things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we've come to time for one more question, whether online or the web service as well. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about your process, really. It's really interested in, like, um, like when you have a project, like, where do you begin? Um, and also, if, during that project, do you have, like, ever have, like, the imposter syndrome come in and say, no, no, that's not quite right, you should be doing that? Mm -hmm. And also, when you get towards what you feel like is the end of the project, like how how do you know that you're yeah how do you know when to like stop? Mm. So it's like yeah when to begin yeah <laughs> or how to begin. how to begin. Um, what happens in the middle or like do you, yeah and at the end how do you kind of think right this is it this is yeah tick, finished yeah okay <laughs> so the beginning bit is different every time I think. Like if I'm working with an archive, sometimes I, if I've been commissioned, I might have like some kind of agreed for parameters yeah. and that's, that can help shape me in some way. Other times I might go to an archive, I've got no idea and I just let that lead me. And that's the same for working with people sometimes. Um, like that the question about New Orleans is like, I don't know what I'm going to make. I've got, I, I know that I have to make a book and I have to make a film. And I, and I want to do both of those things, but I don't know what shape they'll take or what they'll be about necessarily. I have lots of different things that interested me, peaked interest and have kind of woven, started to move together, but I still don't know what it's going to be. And, um, and that's, re that's really good. I want to have some more projects that completely just come from my musing or my head doing crazy things or thinking about something or being angry about something or upset about something. I, I want some more of those projects. Um, but I also, it's a, it's just a completely different process yeah. where you have a brief or parameters. And absolutely I have imposter syndrome all the time. I don't, you know, and I have anxiety about, oh my God, is this useless or is this terrible or, um, so it's about, should I be making this? Which is not necessarily imposter, it's more about that kind of ethical question about, should I be doing this? Am I the right person? Am I going to explore the things that need to be explored? And is my voice the right one to be doing it? So I have those questions often. Um, and then I talk to people about it and I try to figure out, and if I, if I have some of those worries, then I think about how I can change, how I'm gonna do that. So it might be that my voice has to fall back a bit, or fall back a lot or be absent or it you know I think of different strategies um and then but there's always an anxiety about is this is this interesting even to other people what will it do and then I have the constant anxiety because it comes from often curators of you say oh I think I'm going to make this film but you know I've been doing all of this work and I think it maybe it's going to be an hour long and he goes oh, <laughs> like, no, 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 no. watch it they say oh my goodness we're going to so there's kind of practical things that make you anxious too. Um, and then just about, you know, oh God, is this math? Is this interesting? Am I trying too hard? Is it, you know, those kinds of, of questions. And I think they're vitally important. And I would hate to never have those worries because um, you have to have something within you that questions you what you're doing all the way through. Um, and then that's the bit that enables you to know when you're finished. And for me in that process, it's, it's, I can't do that by myself. So I have people, I have a few people that I trust who will say to me, oh my goodness, what's that in there for? But what's it bringing? What's it giving? And then I go, oh, well, it's, and they're like, you don't need it. And so there's, but they are people that I trust and know my practice and that, who I've worked with for, for years and years and years. And I get to a point where I think I'm finished and then there's more coming. That happens and then I know I'm finished. So um, but sometimes I don't necessarily know with performance until the day it's happening. Like I might suddenly go, oh actually I'm going to take that bit out. Or maybe I'll do that bit for performance and not that bit. So there's something that's about with film it has to be finished because you you need to have it, you know, you need to have any of the post stuff you're having done and the exhibition needs to happen if it's an exhibition, but actually there's a bit more flexibility 
I'm sorry by myself anyway. Yeah. Um, not quite yeah. Cool, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jane. Um, thank you for that. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you, Helen, Alex, and thank you, Dr. Gilbert. Um, and yeah, no, it was a really great evening and it's a really great note to end on in terms of knowing when to finish. <laughs> uh, so I, I do hope you'll have um, you know, some time today to join us upstairs for a private view where you can see a portion of Helen's hour and a half long film. Uh, and it will be open until Sunday. So for those of you who can join us, London and come to visit, come visit the gallery uh, that is available to you. And yeah, uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you for my colleagues. Thank you for you too. And thank you all for logging in and coming here also in person. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening and hopefully we'll see you at some of our future online activity and in person activity as well as we experiment with more hybrid programming. <laughs> um, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.